and I'm, I'm glad that you're here. I'm really excited that we're putting on this workshop. It's been a goal of ours for quite a while, and it's been several years, well, many years, actually, since we've been able to um, put on one of our own workshops. So this is a really exciting, exciting thing for us. So I thought I would uh, just kind of first go over an overview of the registration branch responsibilities. Uh, first of all, we're the primary liaison to the registrants. That's why we're here today. Out here, we're your primary contact with this department. We have scientists in our branch that evaluate certain types of data. So in, in the registration branch, we evaluate chemistry data, microbiology type data, efficacy, uh, phytotoxicity, and any ecotoxicology data. So those scientists reside in our branch for those types of data that you sit in. They, they will be doing the review of it. We also coordinate the scientific evaluation by other branches. So any kind of toxicology data, that's going to get sent to human health and assessment branch. Worker health and safety also takes a look at our labels to look at the worker aspects of them. And then as Mary Lou mentioned, environmental monitoring has three different groups. Depending on the pesticide, they might evaluate the products too. So you have a lot of scientists to go, your products to go past the eyes of. And uh, you know, we, we work on that. So the other thing that the registration branch is responsible for is issuing, making, once we've completed our evaluation of the pesticide products, we bring together all those evaluations and come up with a recommendation. Are we proposing to register or are we proposing to deny registration? So when we propose to register, we're required by statute to post it publicly for a 45-day public comment period. Um, used to be in the early years when I was working in registration, we didn't get comments. These days, comments much more often. People are very interested in what products are getting registered, they're keeping an eye on our notices, and they're writing in and giving us comments. So statutorily, if we receive any comments, we need to stop the registration of that product until we can respond in writing to the comments. And then it's only after that that we can make a final decision. So you'll be told if that happens to one of your products, you'll, your regulatory scientist will inform you We've received a comment and we need to hold off for now until we make a response to it. So things to know about the registration process as you're moving along. Um, and then after that, we'll make a final registration decision. So we're also the primary communicator with, uh, not the only one, but one, one of the primary responses of our branch is to communicate with other state, federal, local agencies. Um, regarding pesticide registration issues. The registration branch um, chairs, we have a pesticide registration and evaluation committee that is representative by, represented, has representatives from several of the boards and departments within the California Environmental Protection Agency that we're in here. But there's also a university um, representative, there's a US EPA representative on that committee. And they meet every other month and we run registration issues through that committee. These are public meetings that are webcast. So very important aspect to it. We, within the registration branch, we have the Registration Resource Center. So that's where we keep all of our labels right now. So the most currently accepted label would be found there. And we offer uh, quite a bit of help to, especially to county agricultural commissioners and other people that have questions about what's registered. Is this use site on a label? We also uh, input the information from registered products into a product label database. So this is available to the public. You can search for you know, a particular chemical, how many products are registered that contain that chemical, what sites, we have use sites coded, we have signal words coded. A lot of information that's on the labels is coded into that database. And it serves its main purpose, well, one of its purposes is not just to look up information about the products, but we have, California has a pesticide use reporting system. So applicators who apply products to agricultural use products or licensed applicators, anybody who's a licensed applicator has to report their use of a pesticide. That combined with our product label database allows us to put out a pesticide use report. So we have reports of use in California for every year. Something that's unique, um, as far as I know, I think we're the only state that has that. We frequently have others that are, are asking for our information, very important information. And then, by law, we're also required to, Mary Lou mentioned, to continuously evaluate pesticides. Uh, a part of that, there's, we, we're constantly doing that with our monitoring and uh, things that enforcement's doing and other branches. But within registration, we also coordinate 
a specific product process that's in regulation that's called reevaluation. So if a product, if we ended up with concerns about an adverse effect with a particular product that's registered with us, we can officially place it into reevaluation. It gives us some authorities to ask for data um, and we'll go through an evaluation process. If it happens to a product that you happen to have registered with us, you'll hear from us. You don't wanna hear from us, but <laughs> you will if that happens. Um, and we'll come out to, to Till we'll finish the evaluation until we come to a conclusion that there's no further mitigation needed or mitigation is needed, in which case we'll take those steps. Or, you know, worst case, if we can't mitigate it, that we'll cancel. One of the things I thought might address, help to address, you know, why we're doing this workshop is that from July of 2016 to June of 2017, we decided to do what we called a submission log results study. We had the regulatory scientists track all their submissions as they came in. And we gave them a little spreadsheet that had a list of different sections that they could look for, where, where they saw, if they saw any problems with the application, what, where was the problem? Was it in the application? Was it in the label? Was it in some other section? And we had them do this for an entire year for all of the submissions that come through. So we were looking for submission quality. We were looking for areas where the department might need to reach out and provide more training like we're doing today and where to identify areas where we can, you know, we can help you provide a better application. So over that year, we looked at 4,398 applications. And to our surprise, 1,835 of them had deficiencies. So not having calculated those numbers before, we didn't realize and certainly did not expect it to be that high. That's, that's actually almost 42% error rate. So that's, that's, why, that's another reason why we're having this little workshop here today. So this is just a little quick graphic to show you how, sort of how they divided up. These were broad categories that we asked the regulatory scientists to check in terms of where they found the errors. But when you look at this, the, in the, we found 24% of, of the applications had errors. And another 24% of the labels had errors. So today, as we're talking about how to fill out an application and what's acceptable on a label, you know, <laughs> listen carefully because we're seeing a lot of errors in these. That's 50% of the errors that we're seeing are coming from just those two areas alone. Um, there was 15% in other documents. There's quite, well, there's several other documents that we require to be submitted with an application. Um, US EPA documentation. We asked for proof of US EPA uh, registration, we ask for proof if you've changed ownership, there are documents related to that. So in 11% of the applications that we were receiving, we're, there were errors in that type of information. It could be that it's just missing in this case. And then about 10% of the time, it was issues with data. So data that was missing, something else. Um, I, you know, I personally, I would have thought the data would have been higher, but no, it was the application and the labels. You know, so. That's, that's uh, super important for us today. And then a little minor one, the fee, but that's, that's pretty low. So then, very exciting for us because we've been looking forward to this for quite a while. We are currently working on what we call the Pesticide Registration Data Management System. And this is an effort to move us from a completely paper-based system, which is what we are right now, to an electronic system. And so that means, you know, we want to go that submissions will come into us completely electronic. There'll be a portal with accounts for each of the registrants and the companies and the, the staff within those companies will each have accounts and passwords. You'll electronically submit your entire submission and internal processing as well will be done electronically. So no longer handling paper. We have pounds and pounds and pounds of paper. I'm sure you have pounds and pounds of pounds of paper too. And I'm sure you'll be, you know, for the most part, we'll be thrilled uh, when we go to an electronic process. So we've been working towards this. It took us uh, a couple years with the state system to um, be able to acquire a vendor. So we spent quite a few years doing that. Um, everything's a little harder with the government, you know. <laughs> but we did it. Um, we, uh, started, we started the project to acquire a vendor in 2013, and finally in May of 2017, the California Department of Technology gave us permission to put out a, make an offer to a company. 
So it was awarded to Trinity Technology Group Incorporated. And they began work on this project in July of 2017. So it's been very exciting, uh, a lot of work, but I think the reward in the end will be well worth it. Now, for you, those of you that are worried, we will continue to accept hard copy submissions for a while. <laughs> no, um, we will continue for now. Um, at some point, you know, we'd really like to see go at some, at some point to 100% electronic submission. But we understand that's not going to be feasible for everybody at once. But once this program is implemented, we will ask that all labels come in electronically. We want to have electronic versions to be able to look through, to do our comparison work. And also, we want to put them up on our website so that they'll be easy to access. You'll see what's the most currently accepted label in, in California. And you know that's the most common question that we get from groups far and wide, from growers to environmental groups to just everybody wants to know what is, what is the approved label in California. So we're going to make this information public. And it's going to be a, a big deal, a big step forward for us. Sorry, did you have a question? Um, I just was wondering when, it, if you have an estimated timeline on when that's going to be. I was going to get to that with the next oh, you slide. Are, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, you're taking you're, away You're getting my, antsy. You're taking away my punchline. <laughs> um, as a part of this group, I wanted to let you know that we've created a stakeholder advisory group. So it's a small group of registrants that are both large and small. And we also have several agents because they're a, a huge component of the groups that submit applications to us that sit on this committee and we meet with them regularly and provide them updates on where we are and get information from them on, you know, how we ask them questions. You know, we're thinking of doing this or that, which would be better for you. Represented on that group are CSPA and WPHA, so two of the big and, and also BPIA. So three of the biggest registrant organizations that we have. And we've asked them to reach out to you when we give them information, you know, it's our hope that they will turn around and reach out to you and send that information to you. Uh, we also hope at some point to put together a PRDMS website. So that way we'll, you'll be able to look and see where the status of the project is. We haven't quite gotten that started yet. It's, it's a lot of work just doing the project. Um, explaining the registration process to uh, IT personnel <laughs> in detail is more complex than I ever thought. <laughs> um, you know, I knew it was a complex pro process, but it's, it's really coming to light now. Writing out literally every single step along the way of what we do and all the variations in it is, is just incredible. So we, we're going to know our process extremely well by the time we get done with this. And, but we need to have that so that they can actually code this program that will run this process for us. So we estimated about two and a half years to complete. So to answer your question, we're hoping to go have our paperless system ready in 2020, hopefully early 2020. So that was all I had. Are there any questions? Um, at the <laughs> beginning, you mentioned the public comment period was 45 days. Um, I thought it was 30. Oh, I'm sorry. I, it, it is 30 days. Freak I'm me sorry. out there for like four seconds. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I cannot I tell marketing that they got to work another No, it is days. 30 days. Sorry. <laughs> okay. It's thank you. Days. Used to be 45. See, that's what happens when you All right. Thanks. <laughs> I can breathe now. You can remember into the past. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, and I hope you have a great workshop.